Aim for the two most accurate words in the English language to describe tonight's game. Also, all-star progeny and all-star intensity. I'm going at Chelsea Gray, just FYI. <laughs> hey, Candace Parker's feeling it, and she should be. She's the cover of NBA 2K. Let's go. Ooh. There we go. Bucks, Suns. There was the extra day off between games three and four, so we'll see how that affects everybody. And we'll see how Phoenix adjusts to the adjustments that Milwaukee adjusted to after they won game three to pull within 2 1 in this series. Monica McNutt, around the horn to you. Who should feel better about themselves going into tonight? It's the Phoenix Suns, Riley, and here's why. Everything that they did in Game 3, well, not everything, most of what they did in Game 3 was a little bit out of character. When do they have six points in transitions? When do they have two second chance opportunities? And when was the last time they shot the three ball that poorly? They just need to get back to some of their winning ways and what has been a signature for them all year long. I maintain my three C's when it comes to this group. Confidence, continuity, and character. They know who they are. They'll adjust accordingly. The three C's for Monica McNutt. Let's go to another C. TC here. Tim Callis show. You see it like Monica, that, uh, that Phoenix is the one who should feel best about themselves going in? I think Phoenix can feel fine about the series. I think Milwaukee should feel best about tonight. I think they found a little something. I don't think the Bucks are as good as the Suns. I know they're much more physical than the Suns. And the combination of Holiday and occasionally Giannis and throwing a little P.J. Tucker in there has bothered Booker. He doesn't like, he doesn't like that. And, and I'm sure he's going to do better than 3 for 14. But that doesn't mean he's going to come out and score 30 and dominate on the road. I think it's going to be hard for any road team to win a game this entire series. I think Phoenix just shoots it well and gets the energy. Guys like Bridges and Payne get the energy from the home crowd, and they're tough there. But I think the Bucks can be very tough to beat at home. Mina Kimes, join us here. Who should feel better going into game four? Whew. Well, first of all, I understand why my fellow panelists are split, because I think this is an incredibly evenly matched mm -hmm. finals, which is why it's fantastic. But I lean Suns for a couple of reasons. One, I think the biggest reason why they lost the last game was because simply DeAndre Ayton fouled out. Don't think that happens again. He only fouled out twice in the regular season, mm -hmm. and in the postseason, that was actually the only game he got up to even five fouls. I think he plays more disciplined tonight. The other thing is, they lost the turnover battle in large part because of Drew Holiday's defense on CP3. If there is one player in the NBA who I think can use those two games off to figure out how to make the necessary adjustments to get to his spots, mm -hmm. it's Chris Paul. Okay. So again, very close, but I do think Phoenix is the better team, and I think the fellas win tonight. And technically, DeAndre Ayton did not foul out uh, last game. He had five fouls. <laughs> we'll take six to five there, appropriately, for Mina Kimes. June Lee, oh. who is feeling best about themselves going into tonight? Yeah, I'm with Monica and Mina here in, in leading the Suns. Uh, I just There's two reasons behind this. I think that Milwaukee's supporting Castor on Giannis has generally been kind of inconsistent. They'll have games where, you know, they really, really light up and they'll have other games where, where they kind of fade back. And then I also think that Devin Booker is, not, is, is going to have a better game. It's impossible, I think, for him to not have a better game. He had 11 games this season where he shot below 35% from the field. And in all of those follow-ups, he averages 44%. Uh, and is averaging 23.8 uh, points per game. Uh, the Suns are also 9-2 and two in those games. And so uh, I just think the Suns are a better team and, and, and are just generally more consistent across the board. As far as strategy, um, and, and the Giannis wall comes to mind, Tim Kalashaw, and, and how to play against Giannis. What he's, he's had enormous games and Milwaukee's lost, and yeah. he's had enormous games and Milwaukee won in Game 3. Go ahead. I, I almost think it doesn't matter. Even in the, if you add in the two regular season games, he's averaging over 36 a game against Phoenix. They don't really bother with stopping him very well. What they need to do is what Mina talked about. Keep DeAndre Ayton out of foul trouble. Don't let the refs call fouls when you're standing there like this, although the refs are going to call him anyway, I suppose. But just try to get off of him and, and just try not to let Middleton and Holiday and everybody else beat you up. That's your strategy? Don't let the refs call fouls? You have no control over that, Tim. <laughs> Monica, strategy-wise, here for either team. 
I mean, the basketball saying goes, as far as it pertains to Giannis, at least, is to do your work early. I don't know that you can flat out deny Giannis the basketball. It doesn't quite work that way. But you have to do the best you can to be in legal guarding position. And I hate to say it, but TC's kind of right. You got to hope the refs go by the rule of the law instead of what they're feeling in terms of home court. Um, so Kalisha's right? Wait a second. Kalisha's right here? Why do you hate to Do we say have to it? stop the show, bring out balloons, and throw a parade? You are part of this, Tony. You like, want to give points to him? Go ahead, Monica. But had the same issue when the game, the first two games were in Phoenix. So the officials are going to be a part of this. Let's not get into the Scott Foster CP3 thing because we could go there if we wanted to. But more importantly, Let's go there. I think this we're here. Let's go there, Monica. Okay. Well, <laughs> CP3 lost another game officiated by Scott Foster in the playoffs. So look at that. He went Let's there. Go. It's been, it, there is where we are. Last word, Mita Kimes. Well, it, it, as much as we can talk about adjustments, as much as people love to blame Bud, this really comes down to shooting variants. Like, I, I hate to say it, but these teams are very matched. And the team that, w if the non Giannis's shoot as well as they did in the last game, the Bucks will win. If they don't, All right. they're. All right, great. So it's about refs and who makes shots. Thank you very much for the analysis here. June Lee, make a pick for tonight's game. I'm team. <laughs> uh, I got the Suns. Monica McNutt. Suns. Tim Kalashaw. Milwaukee makes it 2 2. And Mina Kimes. I got Phoenix. We'll move on. All-star game. Americans over nationals. Could you tell the difference? Be honest here. Could you, could you <laughs> even know who you were looking at when you were watching the game here between these, these teams and these uniforms and these players playing out of positions <laughs> or positions they never played? There was the mic'd up moment. I want to talk about that. Otani's night, of course. But there was this human being right there, the little one, coming back to win the all-star game MVP. Uh, Awesome to see Vladimir Guerrero Jr. rake it like that. Tim Kalashow, what was the story to you? Look, there's so many things not to like about the All-Star game. I'm going to focus on what there was to like, which is important, which was Shohei Otani becoming the first ever to lead off as a DH and start be the starting pitcher. That's still just insane in an All-Star game. And Vlad Guerrero do what he did, and even Pete Alonso the night before to have the 35 home run round. The young stars of the league showed up big this weekend and or this these two days and and that's what the game needs more than anything. Tune Lee. Yeah, Mookie Betts wasn't there. Mike Trout's obviously injured. Uh, this was a really great showcase, I think, for baseball's next generation of stars. You had Vladdy Jr. hitting that home run while Fernando Tatis was at shortstop getting interviewed, and you saw his on-field reaction while all of that was happening. Uh, it was just a really exciting week for a lot of the game's young stars. Obviously, Otani uh, kind of looked human, uh, looked tired during the derby, uh, which I thought was kind of charming, honestly. Um, but I think it was just a really great showcase for, for the game's kind of next generation as we kind of move forward here. Monica McNutt. I really enjoyed it. Tatis' reaction when Vlad he hit that home yeah, run yeah. while he was mic'd up was one of my favorite parts of the entire night, honestly. And I will say that as a casual fan, the game seemed like it was a ton of fun. I loved the post-game interview also with Tom Rinaldi taking his time to share the microphone with the interpreter and making that part of the entire experience, speaking to the appeal of this game far beyond the U.S. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that a national story over the last couple of days? Mita Kimes, <laughs> the biggest story yeah, for you. Was it? It was a national I'd story? Say the big <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, um, you know, aside from the jerseys, which were hideous, it, it was a total win for baseball across the board, especially to have not just young stars shining, but those young stars. As my colleagues have mentioned, the Derby having Otani and Soto, two of the most fun, exciting players in baseball, go head-to-head. -head. I believe ratings peaked at that moment, unsurprisingly. Then to have Otani come out and pitch a great inning was great. But Vlad Jr., being the MVP, Hitting that moonshot, not only was it an awesome moment coupled with the incredible picture, it was also a reminder that as much as we talk about Otani and Tatis as the faces of the league, oh. Vlad's on his way Here we too. go, face you of the game again, you know. At that age. You're allowed no, multiple he, he, faces, I think, as someone, Mina, who gives us the most yeah. faces on the show, and Monica, the two, the two memes we have on the show today. You're allowed multiple faces. I, I mean, the conversation would be a lot Listen. easier if we just allowed <laughs> Go ahead, Mina. Call me Arya Stark because I think it's a good thing for there to be hey, multiple faces. There of the it league. Is. And I was about to say, Vlad leads, leads baseball in batting average, on base percentage. That needs to be accounted for as well. Like, he belongs in that conversation, and he reminded us why last night. All right. The uniforms did not work for you guys. I'm sensing they didn't work. No. Okay. Tim, you can address that, or the microphones uh, being mic'd up. Did that work for you? 
Real quick on the uniforms, baseball is one sport where you can wear different uniforms. You can't do that on a football field and have 11 different uniforms, but you can do it in baseball. It doesn't matter. And see, and, and you can identify the players when the balls hit the left field and they've just made a change. But the microphones for me uh, is much worse, and, it, and it's not Joe Buck's fault. He's told to do this, but the idea of, hey, look at me. I can talk to Xander Bogarts as he's getting ready to take a pitch from Max Scherzer. We don't want to hear that. Xander Bogarts sure as hell doesn't want to hear what kind of pitch you're looking for. Of course, I'm looking for a fastball. Get away from me. <laughs> Monica. Okay, Boomer. As an in-game broadcaster, I thought it was really cool, and I thought Buck did it kind of artfully. It was interesting to watch the arc of the Tatis conversation when he didn't hit the ball the way he wanted to, and he was still trying to get those questions in when he got back to the dugout. I think it's a cool moment. It's an all-star game. Come on, TC. Don't be a curmudgeon. Well, could you see it being applied to the back end of the season? Uh, June Lee, would you be in favor of Mike the players after seeing it last night? Uh... I love the mic'd up players in the ex exhibition game, but it definitely is a little bit distracting. I love seeing Liam Hendricks just like swear his, his, his mind <laughs> off on the mound at the end of the game. It reminded me that uh, if every player was mic'd up all season long, someone would get canceled really, really, really quickly mm -hmm. on a baseball game. Every time. Yeah, uh, I think when the stakes are high, we probably shouldn't hear the players, but in a fun exhibition like this, it was delightful. Did I hear an OK Boomer from somebody on the panel, June Lee? I did. Uh -huh. I heard it. Look, I, I and who was that directed to? Kalashar or Mina Kimes? Just making sure. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's like that. The oldest people. Coming up, if you thought that All Star game was maybe lacking some intensity, roll tape. I'm going at Chelsea Gray. Just FYI. I mean, she was my teammate for years, but I'm like the first time down the court. Like, I just need a back screen and a switch and her on the block. That's all I need. I'm gonna try to go one on one against her a little bit. Sauce her up a little bit, and she gonna probably try to post me up, do a little fake over my head. I'm, I swear, I'm not gonna go for the fake. <laughs> By herself next. So it was a tear in the ACL for Kawhi Leonard, a partial tear. Surgery was yesterday, said to be successful. We're all hearing the news, maybe at the same time. As Leonard looked towards a summer of rehab, that he also has an opt-out on his plate is intriguing. He could lead the Clippers, should he so choose, and become a free agent again. So now we prepare to get in Kawhi Leonard's head here, which may not be possible. Mina Kimes, what can you see happening? Could Kawhi lead the Clippers, in your view? Well, you know, while Kawhi's intentions and motivations are as difficult to ascertain as the scoring system on this very television show, okay, I, I can take that. guess that he's likely to stay in Los Angeles for a couple of reasons. One, they really proved themselves in his absence in the playoffs. Even if Jackson leaves, Terrence Mann, a real gem. Also, the dude just bought a $17 million house in L.A., and he came to L.A. because it's hometown. I think he wants to stay. Tip Kalashaw. Yeah, the more likely thing is to stay and to take that one year and maybe not play a minute of it through no fault of his. We're already in mid-July. We're already a month past where the NBA Finals normally would end. So if he has a nine-month recovery, that would be April. That would be the end of the regular season. Monica McNutt. Mm, guys, you're making too much sense. Did it necessarily make sense to leave a team that won a championship in Toronto outside of wanting to go home? I don't put anything past Kawhi. Yeah, he'll keep his property in LA, but I don't know that I buy that this is the place he's actually going to retire. We know that he is historically fickle about things that don't necessarily have to do what happens just with what happens on the hardwood, rather. We know that we don't know anything. Yep, I'm with you there, Monica and Jun Lee. <laughs> Uh, Kawhi is notoriously the best communicator we know out there, so I'm not totally convinced that he's going to be staying long term. The next game he does play is going to be his first over 30 years old. Uh, there's not a whole lot of time left in terms of his prime, so it's going to be really interesting to see what he does, but I'm just not totally convinced. Uh, the communication with the medical staff clearly has been... See, I took all the heat for bringing up age, and listen to Lee and McNutt talk about he's going to be over 30. It's over for Kawhi Leonard. Times one away in here, Kalisha, any, any idea? Uh, no, we'll just move on. Tonight's WNBA All-Star Game, which is this year's Team USA versus Team WNBA. Here are the rosters. There is a good amount of intensity between the squads looking at the rosters. Showed you Candace Parker before. The desire there for her after being a snub for Team USA is strong. Monica, does this format change make for a better game? 
I am thrilled about this format change, Reality. I think it's gonna be fantastic. Now, I do get that Team USA has to prepare a little bit for the Olympics, and I don't know that they're gonna go hard the entire game, but I think this is great. We know that the WNBA is really working to improve its marketing strategy in terms of introducing new names into the conversation. Yes, Candace Parker is an Olympian that's on Team WNBA, but you've also got John Cole Jones, who is also a big in the three-point shooting contest, but Najee Laney's been terrific, Arike Agumawale, and the list goes on in terms of more names that need to be introduced as WNBA greats. Jun Lee. Yeah, I love that there is tension going into this game, that there is a reason beyond just the basketball, which is obviously going to be great, and there's so much good talent on the floor, but there is a tension here because a lot of these players on Team WNBA didn't make the Olympic team. We obviously, Candace Parker is one of the most notable ones, uh, so I'm just excited about that, but it's also going to be really interesting as just a showcase for the WNBA as there's so much young talent, there's so much momentum for that league right now from uh, just an excitement standpoint. So much like the Major League Baseball All-Star game, you're focusing on the young talent that's come to shine here. Mita Kimes, how about you? You know, as a senior member of the panel today, it's not just about the young talent in this game. Uh, Candace Parker, the guy, the legend, great communicator, uh, love the trash talk, yeah. but also love the prospect of seeing her uh, uh, in this game because this is an awesome front court battle, right? With her on one side, with Liz Cambage, Brittany Griner, and Brianna Stewart on the other. Like, those are true stars facing off, and I cannot wait to yes, watch. Yes, stars versus stars in an all star game, Tim Callis Shaw. Uh, what are you watching for tonight? Yeah, let's not overrate young talent. We get enough of that around here. Let me say this. I think we found out <laughs> that the attacked. NBA and the NHL that just East versus West doesn't really excite people. This is a great way to not only see the Olympic team, but as Monica said, go see Dallas's Arike Ogumawale, and she's scoring 20 points a game uh, for her career. Why isn't she on the Team USA? A lot of, a lot of players. Could the WNBA on. All Stars beat Team USA, Monica? Yes. They, they, there's a world in which they could. This is going to be a great basketball game. I mean, you got to remember, while Candace Parker sort of head, headlines Team WNBA as an Olympian, you've got some of the top scorers in the league on the other side. And Team WNBA is a little bit more healthy. Sounds them. like you're picking Team WNBA. All right. Uh, I'll give yeah, it something. Sure. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> there we go. Buy or sell three. Yesterday's no hitter. That's coined by the guys at Sesame is Barbecue. In baseball's entry draft, because the Angels had 20 picks, and they selected 20 pitchers. June, you're an Angels fan. Were you rooting for this, and how are you receiving it? Uh, this is basically the equivalent of swiping right on everyone on a dating hat, just hoping something <laughs> goes well at some point. Uh, the Angels have necrosy just struggled with their pitching, so uh, I guess this is just emblematic of their, their bigger picture issues. June, that was classic. Mina Kives. Yeah, I'm with it. This is a team that's not only 26 in ERA this year, but has been bad at pitching for a long time. And it's a huge reason why, despite having these exciting players like Trout and Otani, they are not contenders. Shoot your shot widely, as June said. <laughs> Tim Kalisha. <laughs> the Angels, Class A, Double A, and Triple A teams are also in the bottom half of ERA in their leagues. They don't have much pitching anywhere. They had to load up. Monica McNutt. Haven't been over, <clears throat> haven't been over 500. Excuse me. In the last six seasons, they got plenty of issues. But I will say, I know that this draft isn't as instantaneous in terms of results as some other sports. So maybe there's a diamond in the rough there. Mm. Fire take from everybody today. But we're going with Jun Lee with big score and Kalashaw in showdown. Whoa. Two minutes. And in the third exhibition. Team USA finally won. 108 80 over Argentina. So coming back after the two losses to Nigeria and Australia in the most talked about run up exhibition games to Olympic basketball ever. Tim, June, welcome to Showdown. Kalashaw, is all good finally with Team USA? All good for the Team USA. It was already all good. They're all good. They're going to win going away in Tokyo. The team with Kevin Durant and Lillard and all the players coming from the finals, they're not going to get beat. Mm -hmm. June Lee. I thought it was an overreaction in the first place that Team USA was getting, you know, this much concerned about whether or not they'd be good. It's been a long NBA season. Um, I'm going to start caring when, when the Olympics actually starts. Okay, so neither of you care. Interesting tactic there from June <laughs> Lee. Uh, uh, Lee will right. lose a point there. Kalish, I'll keep you at zero. We're going to move on. Rob Manfred saying Las Vegas would be a viable option if Oakland can't close the deal for a new stadium for the A's. June, is that threat or real talk? 
It's more real than it has been in the past. There's a lot of potential cities that would work for a, for a team to move. Nashville, uh, Portland, uh, Montreal. So it's more real, but I'm going to wait until we see it. Mm-hmm. Tim? This has been going on for about three decades now. It's very real. Uh, some, but some cities, some areas don't cave to owners who want them to do things. And then the problems in the East Bay are enough that I, I think the A's, unfortunately, are gone. See, this is when you have a veteran versus, uh, I'm not going to call you a rookie, June. You've had about seven shows now. But uh, the wait and see approach, the I don't care approach, you're going to have to wait and see if you win FaceTime next show. Tim Kalashaw takes it. Yeah. What did I tell you about young talent? Uh, let me tell you this about the All-Star Game and the Home Run Derby. I used to think the Home Run Derby was unwatchable because it's too long. Now it's just unwatchable because it's unwatchable. <laughs> you literally cannot see the balls land when somebody hits it 500 feet oh, because they boy. went to a clock, and now you're already seeing the hitter. The hitter doesn't get to watch it either. You, you think the guy crushes the ball. Hey, he really got that one. Maybe. I don't know. we got to watch him swing again. He's got to keep okay. swinging. He's got to get in those 35 swings. They never should have gone to a clock. You can shorten it. You don't need eight players. You don't Just need three when rounds. we went to the veteran, get off my lawn, the mudge, Tim Callis.